Security Now. When I taught a previous operating systems course, the ECE one, EC254, that was retired a few years back, um, after the introduction, we spent some time talking about the history of operating systems, you know, talking about the different generations of operating systems and how we got to where we are um, in more modern versions of the OS. While some understanding of the history of the thing might be helpful in explaining some of the design decisions, um, the discussion was just too vague and too high level to be useful. There was a certain element of cool story bro to it, uh, and it ended up just being like, ah, uh, you know, this is some nice trivia, but I don't know what we would do with it. And it's not the kind of thing that I would ask on an exam because you know, the exam should be about assessing your learning, not memorizing random trivia about you know, second generation operating systems from the 1970s. So actually, we're gonna talk about security. Well, actually mostly you know, a related concept called protection, but also security. Now, the thing about this is in a lot of textbooks and even in some previous uh, operating system courses that I've seen, this is left to the end. Um, that strikes me as being a problem, right? Security is something you want to bake into your design. It's something you want to have in your mind constantly as we go over the uh, topics that we're going to talk about, something that you want to think through you know, at every stage of the design. It's not something you can just bolt on afterwards, right? The, this is not you know, additional functionality. If you don't make good decisions about security, you will not have a secure system. Uh, and you can't go back and revisit every decision with the security hat on after they've been made and implemented. Um, it's kind of unrealistic. So as we go through the course, I mean, we are going to um, talk about it occasionally. We're not going to necessarily call it out at every uh, at every stage, but it would be interesting as you go through the course if you think about security at each topic. So if we talk about inter-process communication or if we talk about uh, memory allocation or something like that, it would be interesting if you consider, huh, what, what would be the security needs or the security implications or the security problems with this situation? Uh, and that would be uh, a good thing to keep in mind. Um, now, an operating system is designed to support multiple users concurrently, each of whom is potentially running multiple programs. Um, so there's there's those things where we have to worry about okay you know this is my program you know i'm, I'm writing my essay i don't want you know, somebody else to see it um but there's also the operating systems processes itself right the operating system has its own tools and utilities that are there to you know, manage resources and do its work um, and they're not really under the user's control right um it's not the same thing as having you know, your text editor open um even if you're the only user on your system, you know, it's my laptop, there are no other user accounts, those kinds of things, um, the operating system still needs to enforce certain rules so that malicious programs or malicious websites can't steal your personal data or sabotage the system. Um, and operating systems create policies and policy tools, uh, and some policies are part of the operating system and you can't really change them. Um, for example, a file has to have the execute permission in Unix if you want to execute it, you know, if you want to run it. Um, others are configurable by system administrators. For example, um, may a non-administrator user install a new program on the system? Uh, you might be comfortable with yes, uh, your organization might be comfortable with no. Um, those are configurable uh, and whatever policy you configure, it's the responsibility of the operating system to enforce that. Now. Security policies have a trade-off with usability, right? It can be frustrating for users who are denied uh, the ability to do some operation uh, and they have to ask administrators to do it for them or your security policy maybe forbids, I don't know, um, backups being taken uh, of, of your laptop, which is kind of silly because what if my laptop goes for an unintended swim? Um, it, it's probably not great to not have backups, but those kinds of things are you know, trade-offs where the organization uh, or the individual user who's the administrator decides what they think is appropriate for security policy. 
Uh, and so, yeah, too restrictive means that people sort of do the wrong thing. They don't um, follow the uh, policies. You know, the classic example of this is if you make the password rules too complicated so nobody can remember their password, they just write it down on a sticky note and they attach it to their monitor. Um, and that, of course, defeats the purpose of the password. Um, but you also can't be too lax about it, right? Um, you do not want to find your company's name on TV having to report a data breach in which user personal data was stolen. That gets very expensive, uh, and I don't just mean, you know, in the sense here where the security budget after the data breach is, you know, a larger amount of loonies. Uh, I mean in the sense that, like, there are fines that, you know, may or may not uh, impact your company's ability to survive. Um, and whatever policies that we have, whatever ones are configured or built into the system, whatever, they have to be enforced consistently because rules are only rules if they are actually enforced, right? Um, you know, that's, that's one thing to say, um, you know, that um, stealing is forbidden, but if there's no enforcement of the rule against stealing, well, you can probably imagine some people will steal anyway. Um, so we have to be careful. We don't want it exploited by malicious users. Um, and uh, whatever the specifics of our system, um, if it doesn't provide proper protection and security, it will eventually be exploited by malicious users. Uh, and if your operating system is sufficiently insecure, it will cease to be used, right? You know, the um, US government say will you know, declare that you know, they're not using such and such phone anymore or such and such operating system. Uh, on their PCs anymore because it's insecure uh, and it is a problem. That's not the kind of publicity that you want. So there are three desirable properties that are worth talking about here, um, and they are confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Coincidentally, the acronym here, or um, so someone's going to post in the comments, it's actually an initialism uh, and, and not a, an acronym. So like, yes, I am aware. Um, so the initialism, CIA, uh, confidentiality, integrity, availability. Um, confidentiality, just giving super brief definitions of each of these, uh, is information should only be accessed by those who are authorized to see it. Integrity, the information should be consistent and correct. And availability is information or services should be available when they're needed. Okay, easier said than done. Uh, you know, some of these things are hard to do in real life. You know, perfect uptime for availability is probably not feasible, um, but we'll do our best. We'll try to get as close as we can. Um, and now I want to talk about a distinction between protection and security. Um, protection is about internal threats, right? It's making sure that user Morgan cannot access the private files of user Taylor. Those are protection issues, making sure that nothing goes wrong internally. And then there is security, which is about external threats, making sure that you know, evil hackers don't gain access to the system. We'll talk about them in order, protection first, then security. Okay, protection. Third level abjuration spell, casting time, one action, range 30 feet. Oh no, nope. This isn't even official Wizards of the Coast stuff, so never mind. Most of the discussion really um, that we're gonna think about here is around protection. How does the design of the operating system ensure that the rules are followed? Right. Following the rules is important to make sure the system functions as intended, uh, and without it, you know, anarchy results. Right. As much as we'd like to live in a world where everybody is nice and nobody does anything wrong, have you seen the news any time in the last three years? Um, even if you did have a system where all the legitimate users lacked malicious intent, um, it would be possible for someone to you know, disrupt the experiences of others by accident, right? That happens sometimes, you know, we have ECE operated servers and sometimes unintentionally writes a program that exhausts shared memory uh, or gets in an infinite loop and consumes excessive CPU time. They didn't do it maliciously, it's just a bug in, in their code, you know, their um, breakout of the loop condition is wrong. It wasn't malicious, but it still had a negative impact on other people. That impact can be limited by appropriate protection rules, but we can't sort of rule out um, these things uh, as you know, impossible, uh, even in the absence of malice. Now, what are the goals really of protection? Um, as I said, it's ultimately about enforcing the um, policies that system administrators design about responsible usage of the resources. 
Uh, and what is responsible and reasonable for a given system is potentially very different as compared to another system. Some servers are dedicated to running exactly one service, and there's nothing wrong with letting that service take all the available CPU time, all the available memory, fill up the whole disk if it wants. There's no, no issue with that. Other servers, like the, the EC Ubuntu servers that I just mentioned, are meant to be shared amongst hundreds and hundreds of students, any of whom could be working on different courses at any time. So it would not be okay for any one process or even a small number of processes to monopolize the resources that are available there, right? These are, these are different because the systems are different, the goals are different, uh, and uh, so we can't generalize necessarily. Um, an obvious case, uh, just as an example, for access control as permissions on file. There are many files on a shared system, but not all of them are yours. Some of them belong to you, some of them belong to other users, and yet others belong to the operating system itself. You wouldn't want to do your assignment on a shared server that had no enforcement of ownership. Um, it would be all too easy for someone to just copy your code uh, or delete it to sabotage you. I mean, I hope nobody would do that, but I mean, they could, right? Nothing would stop them. Um, another example, um, the operating system enforces some, uh, some logical you know, walls, maybe walls should be in quotation marks here, uh, between different processes, um, and we'll see that in a few different cases. For one, you know, the memory of program A is not accessible to other program B unless you specifically ask to allow it. Those kinds of things are important. Now, rules take effort to enforce, as you would imagine. Um, requests and actions have to be checked, right? So when you want to open a file, the operating system has to do work to validate, is this uh, an access that I should allow, yes or no? Um, so exceptions generally are allowed, uh, and usually administrators can override whatever the default policies are. If you use the sudo command, uh, to give yourself super user powers, you know, it would allow you to read a file that you wouldn't no normally be able to read or to execute a program um, that you wouldn't normally be able to execute, um, those kinds of things. Uh, but the operating system looks for, is this a valid request? Um, and valid in this sense means in compliance with the rules of the system as they have been established. Um, but as for exceptions, I mean, you can make a, a file public so that you would intentionally allow others to access it. You can ask your program to use shared memory such that another program can share the same part of memory. We're gonna talk about that a little later. Um, and um, system administrators can do almost anything, not totally anything, um, uh, including you know reading files that don't belong to them. So you can see why we need a lot of trust in system administrators to make this work. Other kinds of rules may exist. We're not limited to just the examples that we've talked about so far. Um, limiting access to data based on rules is a pretty common and a pretty obvious one. Uh, but we could have rules that terminate processes if they use too much CPU time or if they use too much memory. Uh, but those are fairly rare um, in, in the real world, right? There are probably no good reasons for users to read one another's data without, you know, actual explicitly granted permission, but there are frequently good reasons for using a lot of resources. So maybe you're wondering a bit what I mean by that. Well, let's put it like this. You know, I shoot a, a lecture video and I record it. Um, I do some editing and then when I'm editing it, um, I need to then render it. If I edit that lecture video, it consumes a lot of CPU and RAM. Is that bad? I mean, I'm gonna say no. Um, Right, you know, it might use a large amount of memory as I'm putting together all the pieces of content. When I'm editing, you know, the, the render is a CPU intensive task. It might max out all the CPUs in my laptop for quite a while. And I would say it's a legitimate use of the system, right? This is for an educational purpose. I'm you know, doing this to make a lecture video and a lecture video is a part of the course that you're taking, what have you. So this is not you know, playing um, a video game uh, on company time. This is not um, you know, mining Bitcoin using somebody else's laptop what have you, um, but it's still a CPU intensive task. I'm not doing anything malicious, um, but it would set off some alarms maybe if you just said, well, you know, the memory and the CPU usage for this task are very high. Now I'm doing it on my own laptop, so it doesn't really you know, upset anybody. You know, I don't have any alarms configured that says my CPU usage is high. Believe me, I can tell when the fan is spinning. 
Um, so I know what's happening. Um, but if I was doing the rendering on, say, uh, one of the ECE servers, uh, they would probably notice. They would say, huh, you know, that's a lot of CPU you're using there. Why are you doing that? Um, but you might not have alarms for that at all because there might be you know, many legitimate uses that require a lot of CPU. And so if that's the case, um, and we're not super strict, that does potentially allow malicious users to exploit this, to make excessive use of the resources. And when we talk about scheduling algorithms, which admittedly is quite far towards the end of the course, we'll see how a real system will do its best to make sure um, that even if a user is requesting a huge amount of CPU time, that it doesn't impact others too much. Um, and if that's not enough, there is always the opportunity to um, escalate to a system administrator who can do something about it. Um, so this brief introduction, I hope, makes it a little bit clearer um, why protection is important. Um, when we think about file systems or shared memory or anything, but we should also talk about external factors. Um, so let's consider, um, in this case, a few bad things that attackers could hypothetically do. Right, we're not going to talk about security in as much detail as protection, um, but our objective here is to understand the threats so that we could keep those in mind when we're designing our system. Right? Attackers are clever. We can't necessarily think of everything they would do, um, but if we think about different categories of issue and we try to plan accordingly, uh, then at least uh, we have some defenses, right? Just think about how different air travel would be uh, if there were actually no need for security. Think of all the hours of my life I would have back. Um, so here are um, some types of attack that we're going to talk about. Um, not too many things here, um, just, a few, um, just a few things that are important to note. So first one is breach of confidentiality. This is what happens when an external actor gains access to information they shouldn't have, like users' personal details, name, address, um, their private information, health records, financial records. Um, and getting this data is lucrative for attackers because, well, this is stuff you can sell and people want to buy on the dark web, which, yeah, that's uh, yeah, not great. Um, and it's also terrible for the company because a leak of private information tends to make regulatory authorities very mad uh, and they will fine you if you don't, uh, don't do the things that you are supposed to do to defend against this. Um, breach of integrity. Um, this is what happens when an attacker is able to corrupt or otherwise alter data that they should not have access to. Um, this could be totally destructive. You could say you know, erase all users from the database, or it could be very subtle, you know, where the attacker you know, just increases the payroll pay going to a certain account every month, and you know, it's free money, it's free real estate. Uh, that's a problem, right? So we would, uh, we would not like that. Theft of service. Um, this is what happens when an attacker is able to make use of resources that they shouldn't have. Um, this might be getting some paid software as a service without paying, um, or it might be using company servers to mine cryptocurrency uh, or, or do something else. Uh, and a couple of others that are sort of worth talking about, um, breach of availability and denial of service. Uh, this is what happens when an attacker is able to prevent a service from working as intended. Um, it might be overwhelming a service just by sending in too many requests. Um, it might also be deliberately crashing a server that is vulnerable in some way. That if you know that uploading a specific request you know, causes the server to run out of memory and crash and restart, um, that's one way to execute a denial of service attack. I'm not saying do this, please don't. These categories that we see here are not exhaustive. Um, but it gives you an idea of the kind of bad behavior that we should be worried about. Um, and if we want to have a secure system, Good design is necessary but not sufficient. If a house has locks but the owners don't use them, they're not effective, right? Configuration and policies are important, um, but the human factor. Most likely the weakest link in the system is a human. A perfectly secure system, technically, can easily be defeated by phishing uh, with, with PH uh, at, at the front, uh, which is an attacker tricking a legitimate user into handing over their credentials or doing something they otherwise shouldn't. You know, oh yeah, I'll tell you all the payroll information. That sort of thing is harder to design to solve, um, but it's not something we should overlook either. Um, and the categories discussed here are just types of problems that an attacker could cause. 
right? Um, some of them used examples where I gave a specific type of attack. Here's a few ideas. This is not an exhaustive list, obviously, um, that come to mind. Um, so one of them is excessive requests. It's exactly what it sounds like. We try to overload the system with demands, you know, whether we're trying to ask for things that require too much CPU or too much memory or just too many responses. Um, malformed requests send intentionally malformed requests that can cause the system to behave in an unexpected way, crash, return information it should not send. Um, number three in the list, backdoor. Sneaking some code into a program that allows a normally unauthorized access to the system. Uh, intercepting messages, observing the communication between systems and then intercepting messages to change them or to learn information that you otherwise shouldn't have. Uh, this is sometimes called a man in the middle attack. Um, I suspect we should probably call it a person in the middle attack, um, but sometimes in the literature they really do say man in the middle. Um, Trojan horse um, references you know, the, the story of ancient Greece uh, tricking the, the people of Troy. Um, and it's tricking someone into installing something that contains a hidden payload that can do one of the things above um, that we kind of uh, hope that they don't do. So security is, and it really always has been, an arms race. Um, when an exploit or some other vulnerability is discovered, operating system developers need to find a way to guard against it, implement a patch for it, and roll out that patch. Sometimes the security problem is the result of a bug, in which case patching it just ensures the system has its intended behavior. If it's a design problem, um, then changing the design might actually be painful because it will cause existing software to break. And as we discussed earlier, that's something we typically do not like and try very hard to avoid. It gets worse actually, because if a bug has been around for long enough, programs may actually rely on the behavior of that bug. So patching the bug breaks what they do as well. So now what? Right Now we have an interesting choice. Do we break existing software in the name of security? Do we preserve the user program's behavior at the cost of security? I don't think there's any one size fits all kind of answer to this question. That would be all too easy. Um, but it is something that we're going to have to think about. Okay, so before we get too far down the track talking about security and all of that, um, I think we should cut it off here. This isn't a course in security. Um, I think it's fascinating, um, but of course I would. You know, it was the subject of my master's thesis. Um, but the goal uh, that we should be thinking about security, I think, has been communicated at this point, right? Um, and security also means you know, protection in this sense. Um, when we are considering a design decision, when we are asking ourselves why is something the way that it is, or you know, how could something be improved, Including the security and protection considerations, I think helps us to get a better understanding of how it's supposed to work and why it is the way that it is. And that consideration should take place early on in the process and not simply be an afterthought. So that's why we're talking about it right now, immediately. Uh, and not only do I think that's a good idea, I also, as I said earlier, think it's a lot more useful than boring you to sleep with trivia about you know, generations of operating systems.